Welcome everyone to our briefing today on ISO New England's Winter Outlook. We are really delighted to be hosting this event and we're pleased to have so many of our members here from New England. I'm Rona Cohen, I manage our energy and environment program at CSG East. And I just wanna give a shout out to my colleague, Jack Aitken, who's at the Zoom controls today. We are recording this event and it will be up on our website by tomorrow. And just a reminder to please type your questions into the Q&A box and the co-chairs will get to as many of them as they can. We'd really like to have a robust dialogue today. And now I'm gonna turn things over to our Energy and Environment Committee co-chair, Massachusetts State Senator Mark Pacheco, the Dean of the Massachusetts Senate. Senator Pacheco is the founding chair of CSG State Legislative Climate Alliance. And in Massachusetts, among his many leadership roles, he is the founding chair and current member of the Senate Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change. Senator Pacheco, as always, thank you for your terrific leadership and welcome. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Rona. Um, and I want to thank my uh, co-chair, Senator Famica, for being with us as well. Uh, today, and so many legislative leaders from New England uh, that have been, uh, who have joined us uh, today, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, this will be a presentation about uh, the 2021-2022 winter outlook uh, by the regional grid operator uh, for New England, ISO New England. And we want to uh, also thank uh, President Gordon and Willie and Eric Johnson and everyone on the ISO New England team for their proactive work in arranging uh, this opportunity uh, to have a more interactive dialogue with policymakers throughout, uh, throughout New England. Uh, we wanna thank you very much for, uh, for that opportunity. <clears throat> it has been a, a pleasure to see so many states pivoting to clean and renewable energy with policies designed to drive down the carbon emissions responsible for a global climate emergency that we are uh, now experiencing. As those efforts unfold, it's critical for policymakers to have a better understanding of our collective need for robust energy supply, uh, you know, for a resilient energy grid. Uh, before um, Gordon and Eric take us uh, through the power uh, forecast for the winter, I just want to point out that the important role uh, clean energy policy has played thus far. And, uh, and I'm very much focused as a legislator here in, the, in New England, and as so many legislators on this uh, webinar are on really moving forward in pushing clean energy policies uh, all across our region. And the work that we have done together as a New England region on energy efficiency and retrofits and trying to move to uh, ground source heat pumps and so many other technologies that we need to see uh, deployed in uh, a uh, implementation plan that really needs to be sped up uh, so that we can meet the targets that we have uh, throughout the Northeast. Uh, we certainly appreciate uh, ISO New England uh, for continuing to have this dialogue. And we also uh, appreciate it when we see uh, the response to the policies that have been put in place in the Northeast to reduce emissions and to bolster our grid, in particular, a grid that will be resilient and be able to deal with um, issues around uh, demand, response, uh, storage, 
other types of things that we need to have in place if we're truly going to achieve the outcomes that all of our states have uh, been working toward. Uh, so with that, let me conclude my remarks and say that anyone that does have uh, questions, please put them in the chat. We will be uh, reaching out to you as we move forward with the conversation uh, here today. And I wanna turn it over to my co-chair, um, who is uh, an extraordinary leader from uh, the state of Connecticut, uh, Senator Paul Famica. Thank you, Senator, I, I appreciate uh, the kind words and uh, welcome to everybody out on the call. Uh, thank you to ISO for uh, joining us and uh, providing this background information ahead of what seems to be uh, a bit difficult winter coming up. We're gonna uh, explore and thank you, uh, Senator Pacheco, for your setup on what we need to do for renewable energy and how we need to move forward with um, building out that new generation of energy generation infrastructure, as well as storage. Uh, we all know that that's an important factor. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing today uh, how we can move into that um, in a way that that doesn't that's practical that uh, doesn't. Uh, the policies that we're seeing out of Washington, I'm concerned, uh, you know, might provide some of these shortages that we're talking about. So I'm interested in hearing about some of that today. And um, we need to move to renewables, but we need to do so in a way that um, that maintains uh, power for everybody here uh, in uh, in the ISO region. So uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing and. Uh, what we have to say today and working with ISO as we enter our new session in February. Um, I know there's gonna be a lot of conversation there. Uh, so without uh, further ado, let me introduce um, Eric Johnson, uh, part of ISO, and then our lead, uh, our lead presenter today, Mr. Gordon Van Wheelie. So thank you for both for joining us and um, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Formica, Senator Pacheco, and I also want to thank Rona and Jack at CSG for helping to organize. We held a press conference today on the winter outlook. Uh, Gordon will discuss the highlights of that outlook today, but we wanted to make sure we had uh, an opportunity to brief state lawmakers uh, directly with this information. We're very pleased to have representatives and senators and staff from all six New England states. Uh, when we spoke with Senator Pacheco to set up the event, he did ask that we talk about the ISO's role in the clean energy transition and how we view uh, those developments in the region. So before uh, Gordon gets into the winter outlook, uh, he will discuss that and uh, we'll have some slides to share, which we'll also make available afterward. I'd also like to introduce the other members of the ISO team. Uh, Ann George is the VP of External Affairs and Corporate Communications. And Pete Brandine is the VP of System Operations. And with that, uh, Gordon, I'm gonna bring your slides up. I'll turn it over to you. And we have about uh, 20 to 25 minutes for this portion of the event, and then we'll move into the Q&A, which will be hosted by the co-chairs. All right. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you to uh, the senators and uh, for hosting this, and um, also to everybody who's uh, dialed in this afternoon. I'm hoping this will be a start of a series of conversations. Um, our, as Eric mentioned, our initial intention here was to really talk about this coming winter, but I think there's a bigger policy um, issue embedded within the presentation this afternoon, which I'm hoping we can continue the conversation on. So as Eric mentioned, there's sort of two stages to this presentation. The first is some context in terms of our role and particularly our role with regard to the clean energy transition and what's happening in the region as we see the resource mix shift as it has to over the next three decades. And then we'll be doing more of a deep dive into um, this coming winter and some of the concerns that we have. If we could go to the next slide, please. 
So just to sort of start at the highest level, uh, we've got on this slide both our mission and our vision. Our mission is uh, enshrined in our tariff, which is uh, approved by the FERC, and it was uh, put into place a couple of decades ago. Um, this is a short form version of it. It's, it's several pages long, but basically it says we have three major responsibilities. One, to operate the system. Um, the second is to administer the region's wholesale electricity markets. <clears throat> and those markets are the markets that provide the reliability services to be able to operate the grid. And then finally, we uh, have to do transmission planning. So we make sure that the transmission system is reliable. And um, if we have time, we can come back and talk about how those are all changing, all those aspects of our mission as a result of the clean energy transition. Uh, some two years ago, we uh, redid our strategic plan uh, together with our board and we uh, shared with our stakeholders um, last October, a vision statement and some strategic goals. Uh, the vision statement really is a statement of intent in terms of where we're going. And we want to make sure that we signal that we are part of the journey to transition to clean energy. And you know we do so by harnessing the power of competition. So it's the wholesale market structure and advanced technologies. We're gonna need a lot of advanced technologies to be able to plan and operate the grid as we transition to, to clean energy. We don't set the policy uh, within the region, of course. We really focus on operating the grid and administering the markets. And we really look to the states to set the policy with regard to uh, how fast we go on the clean energy transition. Um, and uh, with that, I will ask Eric to move to the next slide. So things are going to change, have been changing fairly quickly, but are going to change more dramatically if we could advance to the next slide. So this just gives you a picture of how the system looked in 2000 and how it looks in 2020. And you'll see that back in 2000, if you look at the oil and coal um, dark blue bars on this chart, that we were getting 40%, 40% of our electrical energy from oil and coal back then and um, some 31% from nuclear. And a small amount, relatively small amount from hydro and renewables. And you'll see the shift that's occurred over the last two decades <clears throat> where basically the oil and the coal has been displaced by natural gas. And that's the source of some of the problems we'll talk about a little later in this presentation. So today the remaining oil and coal units uh, produce um, less than 2% of the energy on an annual basis. So we really uh, only need them for the winter time when it gets cold. Uh, we've seen some attrition of the nuclear fleet, uh, Vermont Yankee uh, and Pilgrim stations. Um, and that's why you see the drop in the bar on the nuclear uh, uh, part of the, of the chart. And we, have, of course, have start, started seeing a uptick in hydro and renewables. And those two bars on the far right of this chart are going to um, grow very quickly over the next uh, three decades <clears throat> with the intention of pushing down that 52% on natural gas really is where we're heading as a region. And so the question from a policy point of view is how do we make that transition be reliable? Next question, next slide. So just additional context, you know this, uh, the states are the entities that are driving the uh, transition. And they're doing this through a variety of different uh, policy mechanisms, including the renewable portfolio standards. So you can see here the uh, requirements from the IPS slide. I won't dwell on it. Next slide. But the various policies that are being acted by US state legislators in the region have already shifted the market in a dramatic fashion. <clears throat> if you were, so this slide uh, on the left hand is a is a pie chart that just shows you the makeup of resources that are being proposed to be developed. So these are developers coming forward and seeking um, to be studied as a potential resource to be interconnected onto the transmission system. <clears throat> the right hand of, of this, the right hand part of the slide focuses on the wind specifically. But to come back to the pie chart for a moment, if you had looked at that pie chart five years ago, 
it would have been largely natural gas <clears throat> resources that were being proposed. And just in a very short period of time, it has shifted very dramatically to what you see here, which is 80% of the resources being proposed in New England are clean resources. Um, I exclude battery storage from that clean resource label to some extent because batteries will tend to um, store a composite of what's being produced on the system at any moment on time. So they're not 100% clean, but of course they're much cleaner than, um, let's say, burning a, a fossil fuel. And you can see the tiny slice there from natural gas. So really natural gas is not being proposed anywhere in the region anymore as a new resource. Um, on the right, what you see is uh, the reflection of that purple uh, segment of the interconnection queue, where you see some 20,000 megawatts of wind being proposed. And uh, it just shows you on the right, the bulk of it is really offshore wind. And uh, as you can see there from Massachusetts down to Connecticut, almost 20,000 megawatts of new offshore wind proposals, a small amount offshore in Maine. And then uh, Maine has some very good onshore wind potential and they're looking to harness that energy. So wind is the dominant, will be the dominant energy supplier in this region once we have built all these projects and connected them to the transmission system. Next slide. So, you know, we're doing this because we want to decarbonize the grid, but we also want to decarbonize transportation and heating. And uh, so the policy uh, plan really is to move transportation and heating to electricity because it will be the cleanest source of energy in the region, but that will drive demand up for electricity. And Brattle uh, Consulting Company uh, did a study on this a couple of years ago, and <clears throat> they were uh, they projecting that uh, electrification could double regional electricity demand on average uh, by 2050. That's going to have profound impacts on the uh, on the nature of the system. And it will push us into a winter peaking system by around 2030. And then the winter peak will grow very quickly after that as we add heating and transportation demand onto the system. And in the same Brattle study, they, um, you know, they said somewhere between two and three times the current winter peak is what we should expect. So that has very big implications for what will balance the system when renewable energy can't produce. So that's a question that we'll come back to. Next slide. Of course, we're all talking about this in the region and it's a national debate <clears throat> because this is not unique to New England, but in order to decarbonize the grid and to add enough resource to be able to power it, heating and, trans and transportation, we're gonna need to add a lot more transmission onto the system because the bulk of the renewable energy will come through grid scale resources as I've said here in New England, that will be offshore wind for the most part, uh, com in com uh, combination with solar energy as well. But it's going to require transmission to interconnect all of this. And so we, the slide just summarizes what's in the pipeline at the moment. We have developers proposing some 13 uh, transmission upgrades um, to help deliver about 3,400 megawatts. But this is really the beginning. Uh, we will need a lot more than that. Uh, wind projects make up roughly 66% of the new resource proposals in the ISO queue, offshore wind projects. Uh, NESCO, which is the New England State Committee on Electricity, uh, who works very closely with us, came to us uh, over a year ago and asked us to study both the investment and cost implications of their uh, 2050 vision for the transmission system. And so we've got that study underway. We've just finalized all the input assumptions in conjunction with NESCO and the, the NEPL participants. And there will be a series of reports coming out during the course of the next year on trying to answer this question, which is what's the most cost-effective way to make this investment to enable these re renewable resources to come on the system. Um, in parallel, uh, at a federal level, FERC is essentially asking the same question as NESCO asked, uh, except they're doing this at a national level and they announced that they are going to be revisiting transmission planning and cost allocation nationwide to further enable clean energy. One of the things FERC asked uh, was whether or not it made sense to extend the planning horizon 
for transmission planning. So most ISOs or RTOs like we are have been planning to a 10 year horizon, maybe 15 at the outside. One of the things that NESCO asked us to do is go beyond that and look at what will it take to reach the 2050 goal. And uh, we just, uh, we've been working with NESCO staff and the NEPOL participants to uh, codify within our tariff that we will now do this sort of long range study on a regular basis. And so we've already actually made some of the changes that FERC envisages for the rest of the nation. So as I say here, right at the bottom of the slide, changes will be required to our tariff. We've made some changes, but there'll probably be more changes required as we work through the question of having uh, sketched out the various scenarios and the costs, we would like to see that the states really take the lead on telling us which of the scenarios they would like to see us pursue, because ultimately it's gonna be the state's um, residents and consumers that have to pay for this. And so deciding what combination of transmission investments are required and how we allocate those costs across the region is gonna be a very important input uh, to allow us to help the states get to where they wanna go. Next slide. This slide just shows you what's uh, been happening with regard to uh, retirements in the region. So we've had about 7,000 megawatts of generation announced uh, either retire or announce retirement since 2013. And these typically include the coal, oil, and the nuclear resources. Uh, we have some 5,000 megawatts of remaining coal and oil that are still on the system, but are likely to retire over the next decade or so. Those are the, uh, the dots in yellow on this slide. And the conundrum is we're relying on these units when it gets really cold. So the swing fuels in this region, when it gets really cold, when the gas pipelines get constrained, are oil and imported LNG, which is normally coming from somewhere else in the world. And uh, part of our dilemma really is how do we work our way out of that dependency over time? Next slide. So as I think about the, uh, the reliability equation in New England, uh, as we look to make sure that the clean energy transition is reliable, I think it's helpful to break it up into these three components. If you think about how do you make sure that we have a reliable power system, there are these three um, components that need to be reliable. And you'll see I've got a traffic light system here that indicates how well I think we're doing on, on each of these. So the first is, is a robust transmission system because you've got to be able to move the energy around. The transmission system is like an interstate highway, highway for the clean energy. The good news is we've spent a lot of money on the transmission system over the last two decades. So it's well positioned to uh, help us take the first steps with regard to the transition. A lot of the retirements that I described wouldn't have happened without the investment in the transmission system um, that's noted here. And, uh, but of course, that's in the context of an existing demand profile on the system. If we're gonna drive demand up over time and we're gonna add a lot more resources, we're gonna to have to continue to make investment in transmission. So that green light is green for today, but it won't stay green forever unless we start continue to make investments in transmission uh, to support uh, the, the clean energy transition. The next uh, component is, do we have enough machinery on the system <clears throat> to basically convert all the energy inputs in the region into electricity when needed? And uh, so we've got a sort of a bifurcated system that's emerged now where the states are supporting one set of resources through power purchase agreements. And uh, the majority of the resources today are dependent on the revenues in the wholesale electricity markets. And the reason I've got an amber light here, just a warning light, is that we're gonna to need to make, continue to make some market design improvements to ensure both the retention and the entry of balancing resources, resources that may not necessarily provide the bulk of the electrical energy that we need over time, but they're gonna be the resources that fill in the gaps when the, uh, when the weather isn't a cooperative. And then the last uh, component here, which I think is a real problem is the energy supply chain. And so we've not talked about it this way in the past, but 
I think all the focus on supply chains these days, I think we've all got a better understanding on what happens when supply chains are weak or fragile or get clogged. And, you know, if you think really about electricity coming from a set of machinery that's connected to the trans to the transmission system, the engineering problem is how do you make sure that the energy inputs into that system are firm enough um, and uh, allow you to ensure reliable output. And particularly when you're in a world when you're relying on variable inputs from solar and wind, what's the, what's the firm balancing energy source that's going to help you make sure that this all hangs together and stays reliable? And I think this is where we're really vulnerable and weak in this region. So the way to solve this problem from an engineering perspective is to make sure that there's enough on-call stored energy in the region or access to uh, stored energy in adjacent re regions to fill the gaps when there's no sun or wind. And you know, if you think about the journey that's ahead of us, as we increase demand for electricity, the gap that we need to address when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine or there's too much wind actually, um, is going to increase over time. And so it'll not be uh, an amount of energy that's needed on average all year round, but it's going to be needed for periods when the weather is not cooperative, and that might be several weeks at a time. And uh, yeah, I've mentioned this in the press conference earlier this afternoon. If you look at other regions of the world that are successfully decarbonizing, they've solved this problem or they've addressed this problem. The Nordic countries, um, you know, the Scandinavian countries, who have made great progress with regard to decarbonization, keep two weeks worth of energy in reserve to deal with wind droughts and, and uh, mainly when they don't have as much solar as we're anticipating on the system, but they run their system on wind and hydro, but they keep enough hydro capacity in reserve <clears throat> in dams to make sure that they can operate the system, provide a reliable electricity uh, for up to two weeks of no wind. Next, next slide. So uh, with that context, I'm going to uh, drop down into a more focused look on this upcoming winter, 21-22 winter. So yeah, some of the numbers um, that we put out in our press release. So we're expecting that uh, the region's demand for electricity to peak somewhere between 19,700 megawatts and 20,300 megawatts during winter conditions of between 10 degrees Fahrenheit and 5 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's sort of a normal winter pattern in New England. And if we get that sort of pattern, um, I think you'll hear me say in a moment, we should be okay. Um, it's really if we are faced with extremes outside of that pattern that we're going to have a problem. So the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, is predicting a milder than average winter in New England. And, and so if you just took that at face value, you would say, you know, what, what are we worried about? Um, but that was exactly the same forecast we had uh, just prior to the winter of 2017, 2018. And we would have what I would call a near miss event in that winter, because really shortly before Christmas, we got a heads up from the weather forecasters that we're going to face two weeks of extreme cold. Basically, a polar vortex came into the region. And uh, we were lucky that we didn't have any reliability problems during that period. And that caused us to make a lot of changes to the way we're talking about the winter and forecasting the winter. And I'll get into that later on. So if we're lucky and, the, and NOAA is correct, um, then we expect to have the resources needed to meet the consumer demand throughout the winter season. The problem is if the weather doesn't cooperate and or we've got some supply chain issues and we're worried about both of those. Next slide. So first let me just say, you know, if you think about the big variables that affect us in terms of operating the system in the winter time, the first really is this issue that's been well documented. Uh, we first uh, encountered this issue back in 2004. The region try to address this uh, issue several times in the past and unsuccessfully. And I think looking forward now, I think we have to accept the fact that we will not see additional gas pipeline uh, investment in this region. 
And so what we face when it gets really cold is that because there's a simultaneous demand from for natural gas from home heating and business heating and uh, electric generators, we end up in a situation where the pipelines can't support that demand. And then what happens is the generators are bumped to the back of the, the line because they never paid for this pipeline. Heating customers paid for this pipeline and they're the ones that are eligible to get access to that fuel first. And in that event, the gas generators, to the extent they can, will turn to other fuels. Um, excuse me, I just seem to have lost my Zoom. There we go. Oh, I'm back. Um, so then the gas generators turn to these other fuels, uh, which typically are oil in tanks, um, either as a backup fuel or if that's your primary fuel, and then uh, LNG, which is really just gas in another form. It's liquefied gas that's brought in from places like uh, Trinidad or Qatar. Next slide. So yes, the first thing that's worrying us for this winter. So the availability, the current storage levels of oil and energy are lower than in recent winters. And furthermore, the prices are very high globally. So there's a supply chain crunch, uh, particularly with regard to LNG. And just to put a data point on this, um, the Ford gas prices in New England are very high, um, even by historical standards. Uh, they're trading $17 per million BTU. They were $19 million uh, per million BTU a week or so back. Uh, I think the prices are softening a bit because of the weather forecast. But nevertheless, the prices in Europe uh, for LNG are much higher than that, almost double. So it's around $30 in Europe and $35 in Japan. And what's driven this really is a sort of a weird combination of events the pandemic is one of those events where um, I think folk under forecast the strength of economic recoveries globally. Um, and there are supply chain issues in this sector of the, of the market as well. And uh, if you've been reading the news, there's a lot of back and forth with Russia over the supply of pipeline gas into Europe. So a combination of those factors has caused prices to be really high. And the, and the problem really for us is that if we're relying on just-in-time supplies of LNG to this region, um, because there are no long-range uh, contracts in place for the fuel, the likelihood that we'll get the fuel, if it's much more profitable to send it somewhere else, is much lower uh, if it gets cold. So uh, the other problem is that uh, you may have read and heard about a national shortage of truck drivers, and that applies here in New England as well. And what many people don't understand is that the light fuel oil, in particular, the fuel oil that we use in our home furnaces, is also the fuel that is used by the gas combined cycles as the backup fuel. And that fuel has to be trucked into those facilities. And so when the weather gets bad and the roads get icy and we have a lot of snowfall, that makes it much harder. We saw that problem in 2017, 18, and we had to appeal to the governors and in the various states to try and relax the uh, uh, the rules around how many hours these truck drivers could spend on the road. But the, the problem that we have this winter is that it, there may just not be enough truck drivers. And so that the combination of the LNG picture and the picture around the movement of light fuel oil in this region worries us um, if we get into a situation where we start relying heavily on those fuels. And then finally, um, we know that emissions restrictions could limit the availability of dual fuel and oil fired plants. This is less of a concern than the other two in the sense that we have had a lot of great cooperation with the states when we've needed to relax these emissions restrictions because there are uh, problems on the system. So. Uh, that's a problem. We know about it, but uh, we can work through that one, I think, with the states. Next slide. So I've mentioned this. NOAA is predicting above average temperatures. But as I also mentioned, a mild weather forecast doesn't eliminate the risk of prolonged cold snaps. If we get a chance, Pete can speak to you, our operational experience in the winter of 17, 18. But really, um, literally up until a week before, maybe five days before that cold snap, we had no forewarning of it. And so uh, 
one of our realities uh, these days is to deal with much more unpredictable weather. In, and particularly in the winter, the issue is polar vortexes. And there's a whole uh, science around that that uh, we'd be happy to chat about as well. So uh, uh, we know that prolonged cold snaps heighten the risk. We were lucky in the winter of 17, 18, not to have any major outages. So for example, we did not have an outage of Millstone, for example, in Connecticut, or the Hydro-Quebec line, or the Seabrook power, a nuclear power station up in New Hampshire. If we'd had one of those two major, two, one or two of those major outages during the winter of 17, 18, we would have been resorting to controlled power outages or rotating outages in order to manage supply and demand. And so that's really how close we came in the winter of 17, 18. Next slide. So we've changed how we're communicating about um, the winter uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of which was that we realized that some of our prior uh, communications have been a little too technical. We talk about the 50-50 the forecast and the 90-10 forecast. These are a 10% probability and a 50% probability and so forth. Uh, but we felt that it would be better to relate uh, the forecast for this winter to prior winters that we've experienced within the last decade, because people remember those winters and it's more easy to relate to. And also the other thing that has shifted our thinking about communications on this topic is what happened in Texas, quite frankly. So we think it's important that, you know, why we've always had these communications with a small group of people in this region, the state uh, policymakers and the state regulators uh, and our, our market participants, that really amounts only to a few thousand people and there are 15 million people living in this region. And for the most part, I think the 15 million people don't recognize how uh, precarious things can be when the weather gets really bad here in the region. So in that sense, we uh, decided to run some analysis against previous winters as, as sort of a, uh, a way of communicating the risks for this coming winter. So if we if this chart really tries to capture all of that, so the, we ran three scenarios. Uh, we looked at, given what we have today, which is roughly 2000 megawatts of less firm energy resources than what we had in the winter of 2017, 18. Um, what would, uh, if we get a winter like last year, the winter of 2020, 2021, which was mild, how will things look from an operational point of view? And the good news is it looks fine. So, uh, so that's the winter we're hoping for. Actually, we're hoping for a repeat of the last four winters. So after the winter of 2017, 18, we had a string of really warm winters and we're all hoping that that will be the same again this winter. However, we could get a replay of winter of 17, 18, where we had a two week cold snap in the middle of it and we think we should be okay as long as nothing big breaks um, and we get resupply on fuel when needed, but it may require us to implement some limited energy procedures. For example, uh, declaring uh, capacity deficiencies, being in reserve shortage for periods of time and so forth. Uh, if we don't, if we avoid big outages, then that'll be the worst of it. If we get outages under that circumstance, we might also have to go all the way into some kind of rotating outage. Um, the last uh, scenario on the far right here is the winter of 1314. If you remember, that was a pretty bad winter and uh, we had below normal temperatures, but th there were four of them and with very limited time to catch for the fuel supply chain to catch up and replenish in region storage. And so that's the scenario that worries us the most, because if we have a situation like that, given the, our posture going into this winter, we uh, might really be uh, behind the curve with regard to energy adequacy and be short of energy for multiple days or weeks at a time. And that's when we'd be calling for um, extreme conservation measures. So as I mentioned uh, to begin with, all of these scenarios assume there's no significant generation of transmission outages and a, a limited degree of fuel replenishment. If we get moderate weather, mild weather, and we get good fuel replenishment, none of this is gonna be a problem. 
but we wanting people to understand, you know, where the pinch points are with regard to reliability. Next slide. Other point I wanted to make on this slide is, and it's been much written about Texas, the biggest problem in Texas was the lack of appropriate weatherization of both the gas pipeline systems as well as the generators. And so you've got this feedback loop happening where they couldn't get gas to the generators um, because the gas wells were freezing and then they lost electric um, supply and that worsened the gas situation and so forth. So the good news is here in New England, you know, our generators and transmission lines are better winterized. We know how to operate in cold weather. So that's really not our risk. The risk though, is the, the same input problem in some ways that happened in Texas, but for different reasons. So our issue is when we, when it gets really cold, um, we can end up in a situation where there's not enough fuel coming into this region. There's not enough of an energy supply chain into the region. The second point I wanted to make with this slide, uh, and here I'm showing you the event in Texas, uh, the Texas event as it's called, but it was really a, a polar vortex that occurred uh, over the week of February the 12th. And look at the size of this weather event. So the dark purple on this chart is 25 degrees below average. Um, so whatever you think average is at, in, in a particular part of the country uh, in the second week of February, um, this was 25 degrees below, and it was a thousand miles wide and spanned, uh, you know, 1500 miles, but of course it went all the way up into Canada as well. So this was a massive polar vortex event. And quite frankly, we were lucky that we escaped it. So if that system had been 800 miles to the east, we would have been in the middle of it and we would have been in trouble. So the point I want to make with this is that transmission ties to neighboring regions are helpful as long as the other regions are not facing the same problem. And, uh, and so under those conditions, um, New York and uh, Canada will be stretched as well, and there'll be limits on how much they can help us. And so I think that's the issue that I'm really worried about in the long run, which is how do we make sure that we've got enough in-region storage and or we've contracted for enough storage around us um, to be able to keep ourselves uh, in, a, in a decent situation from an operating perspective over a long duration weather event. Next slide. So uh, during every uh, winter, we go through a whole process uh, of looking forward at the winter uh, outlook. We consult with generators, industry stakeholders, and government officials to review the forecasts. One of the things that came about as a result of the winter of 1718 was we developed a mechanism to be able to communicate and share with the marketplace and policymakers at large and the picture that we were seeing from an energy adequacy point of view, just so that we have regional situational awareness on the energy adequacy situation. And, uh, and, and the reason we want to do this is because if we see trouble coming, we're going to need to appeal to states and consumers to help us conserve energy, both electrical energy as well as gas uh, usage in the region, perhaps for an extended period of time. And as Pete will say, uh, if he gets the opportunity in the Q&A session, this is not about just getting by for one night. Um, you know, very often in the summertime, this is about getting through a peak for a few hours in the, on a very hot afternoon so that the system can recover and then we reset for the next day. If we get into an energy adequacy situation, we will end up being short of energy for multiple days, uh, perhaps weeks on end. And then the challenge from an operational point of view is how do we husband the fuels that we have within the region to be able to ride through that event? Next slide. So transitioning now to, um, you know, how do we make sure that we make this work as we uh, engineer the system to ensure a reliable clean energy transition? So I think what I've tried to make the point uh, here in this presentation is the red light against the energy supply chain is where our problem lies. 
And that's because we don't have sufficient in-region energy storage and we have limited access to hydro storage in, in Quebec. And we have this continued dependence on a fragile fuel supply chain for, for gas and oil. And quite frankly, the oil is, the, is probably the next sort of domino to, uh, to fall over uh, in the sense that those resources uh, run very seldom and therefore get very little revenue in our marketplace. But we're unfortunately dependent on them because we don't have many other options. So I think to allow the transition to continue, we've got to find ways to uh, bring additional energy into the region to allow the transition to occur. And that sort of sets up the next point, which is bringing in additional energy onto the system, of course, can be done with renewable energy in the form of offshore wind and increased uh, imports from Canada. But these are difficult projects to develop and, and particularly be cited, as we've just seen up in uh, Maine with the rejection of the NECC line. And, and so there's lots of uncertainty about when these resources are going to come on the system. And even once we've got them on the system, particularly if it's offshore wind, we're going to need this balancing resource and balancing energy um, forever. It's never going to go away as a, as a need. And we need to make sure that we've got a way of transitioning what that balancing energy source looks like. It's gas today mainly. Uh, and the question is, what will it be? What can we have it become over time as we uh, go through this multi-decade transition? So we're studying uh, these problems. We've, uh, because of the request from the states and our, and our stakeholders, uh, we've launched the Future Grid Initiative. It's been underway now for some 18 months. There's many different dimensions to this, ranging from transmission planning to market design. But ultimately, this effort that we have underway will help us quantify the trajectory of the region's power system, as well as quantifying the nature of the reliability services needed to ensure a reliable clean energy transition. And I think with that, we're at the end. So we're happy to engage in conversation and uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Gordon. And Gordon, I'll maybe turn it back to uh, Rona and Senators Pacheco and uh, for Mika to see if they want to field any questions or ask any questions. Senator, I will turn it over to you. I think that okay. Jack is in the process of uh, bringing up everybody's video right now. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And, and let me just begin by thanking uh, Gun uh, for uh, the over overview and the presentation in giving policymakers uh, a broader understanding of the complexity of the, uh, of the grid, uh, which it certainly is uh, a balancing act in terms of trying to make sure we, uh, you know, get to the requirements and the goals that the individual states have put in place relative to their policies, while at the same time, from a practical point of view, being able to meet those goals while meeting the needs of, of the region. Uh, thinking about that and looking at uh, REGI, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that we have worked on in uh, the Northeast and the success that we've had in terms of a lot of monies that have been invested in modernizing and making our energy system more efficient. While some of that has happened, uh, I believe uh, that we've only really scratched the surface in terms of what we can be doing as a region. Uh, I look at uh, my own state in Massachusetts, what we've done relative to investing in energy efficiency. And yet, I know that we've got a tremendous waste uh, in, in, our, in our existing system. Uh, we're, we're wasting energy that is not getting uh, to uh, the homeowner, the business. Uh, uh, we just, uh, it's, it's just, it's not being, it's not uh, an efficient, you know, system. And there are so many things that we need to be doing 
in terms of the deep retrofits, the deploying new technologies in energy efficiency. Could you tell us a little bit more, Gordon, or your team, about what, uh, what you see happening regionally, what we can be doing more of to uh, stop the tremendous waste of energy that, is, that, uh, that we should be doing at the same time we're looking at all of these other resiliency measures. You raise an excellent point. And uh, you mentioned Reggie, and the ISO has been pretty clear about this. We think carbon pricing is essential, actually, as part of the transition. Um, we're doing a big study on it right now with our stakeholders in the States in terms of comparing within the wholesale market structure whether or not we should try and drive renewable energy through um, a continuation of the out of market um, power purchase agreements that have been deployed to, to this point versus something called a forward clean energy market versus what we call net carbon pricing. But <clears throat> the only reason we're actually talking about a lot of this is because we've not been able to put a big enough price on carbon within Reggie, to be honest with you. you know, so I think the, uh, the many studies show that the price one has to put on to carbon has to be a lot higher to drive the market to value decarbonizing um, energy sources, including addressing the inefficiencies that you've just described. So you need to make it expensive to waste energy or, or to emit carbon emissions. And, uh, and so, you know, I think pretty much every economist out there would say carbon pricing is the way to go. This is not a problem that's unique to us in New England. Um, it's a huge debate federally. It's a huge debate internationally, as you saw in the meetings in Scotland some weeks ago. <clears throat> uh, we couldn't get to agreement. We couldn't get to yes on putting in place some methodology for pricing the thing we don't want, which is the carbon emissions. And so from a policy point of view, I think that's one of the tools that we have and we're not adequately utilizing it here in this region. Yes, but uh, just to just to follow up on that, if I if I may, uh, Gordon, uh, you know, uh, cap and trade system, which Reggie is, and and other types of <clears throat> proposals that have been put on the table, politically haven't been, you know, necessarily accepted at the state level, and something that is being talked about nationally, as we uh, as we speak. Uh, but there are literally billions of dollars that are that are heading and have headed to the states uh, and will head to the states relative to transportation infrastructure uh, in in uh, you know in Massachusetts just this past uh, just this past week we just got through uh, voting on an initiative that would uh, expend uh, close to three billion dollars of of uh, federal federal uh, funds uh, in you know just a whole myriad of programs. We still have about two and a half billion dollars left uh, that we'll uh, look at in terms of how those funds are going to be deployed. So if you start to take a look at the New England states and you 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 start taking a look at the amount of money that is available if we acted together on some uh, infrastructure investments to upgrade uh, you know, some of the work that could be done to, uh, in energy, fish, energy efficiency, you know, partnering with homeowners, partnering with businesses, partnering with manufacturers to get our policy goals implemented, reducing uh, the need for energy uh, because we have more efficient systems uh, put in place. Uh, we could be doing a lot more of that. And I, I just don't see ISO uh, 
pushing us along in that regard. It just seems like we're, 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 we're pushing back the other way more often. And I think looking at this comprehensive uh, program that, you, that you're running, I think a big piece of what we as policymakers need to be educated about is the waste in the system and where we should be investing uh, to make sure that we eliminate that waste uh, because that's the most expensive kilowatt hour there is, is the one that's being wasted. Uh, so just to, you know, any, any further reaction to that, but I, I uh, you know, when I've traveled to Europe in uh, some of the other uh, countries there, uh, that's, that's one of the number one things that they focus on is energy efficiency as a policy uh, that they become very frustrated with if they don't see that being being uh, you know set forth as a major priority. So I you know I think I agree with you both on energy efficiency as well as carbon pricing. I, I think the point I'd make on on carbon pricing is we do not have the authority to drive that. And um, so the environmental objective is outside of our purview and we need to have the states do that for us <clears throat> and so i think to make this clean energy transition be successful both economically as well as from a reliability point of view we really do need to work together as a region i think the point you made a moment ago i agree with totally is we're a relatively small region to begin with and we have six states within that region and the uh, economies of scale of energy are such that we're far better off working together than, um, you know, uh, a set of loosely coordinated policies. So I think the efficiency question of how do you make the transition occur most cost effectively is, is really going to be a uh, uh, foremost question in, in our minds collectively, I think, in, within the region. And um, I know that the state regulators, um, your colleagues in the states are thinking deeply about this problem and, um, and hence they've requested various studies of us to help inform them in that debate. The challenge is going to be how do you get collective behavior by the states though? I think that's going to ultimately be one of our challenges. I think one of the ways we might do it is right after the next election. You know, <laughs> that might be one of the ways it gets done. But I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just follow up with one final thing and then turn it over to my colleague, uh, Senator Famiker, and then we'll open it up to questions uh, uh, for everyone here. Uh, I just wanted to just stay on this one piece on the cap and trade system that we have in the transportation climate initiative that obviously with Governor Baker moving away from that now and I think part of that was the politics of where we are you know in terms of getting all the states in the northeast uh, to uh, <clears throat> to get on board I must uh, I must say that if you go back and you look at the evolution of Reggie you know, all the states weren't on board at the beginning. Uh, and as a matter of fact, throughout the implementation of Reggie, there have been states that have been in, and then they've been out, and they've been in, and they've been out again, and then they're back in. Uh, and a lot of that depends on the leadership in the, in the corner office of those states and legislative leadership, depending upon what takes place. One thing that is true is that with some of these markets, you don't necessarily have to have it be just New England. Uh, for example, we have, a, we have a cap and trade system in the West and, and uh, uh, an entity in the East, Quebec, is, is actually a part of that uh, transportation climate initiative that is there uh, for California and uh, other states in the West, along with uh, Quebec and Massachusetts could join that. Uh, other states or DC could join that. So there are opportunities for us to continue to move forward 
in a in a small way as we as we get involved with a transportation climate initiative very similar to what took place oh so long ago now with Reggie when all the states were not on board originally but eventually it's grown to a uh, a uh, a significant uh, a significant entity. Uh, I just wanted to get your opinion on joining a transportation climate initiative that goes beyond New England, uh, because that will generate some revenues to invest in, uh, you know, eliminating some of that waste, the energy efficiency piece that we need to be uh, aggressively moving forward with either through a TCI or utilizing this federal money that's available. I um, must be honest, I hadn't thought about that angle um, on it. So I can't give you a really good thoughtful answer on it. My instinct, so I'll just give you my instinct. My instinct is that it's more effective if we can actually get the New England states as a whole to mm -hmm. collaborate, collaborate because of that economy of scale problem that I mentioned. So I could I could see that as as a policy matter. If you what you're trying to do with something like TCI, if you can't get it off the ground here in New England and you want to use a cap and trade system with people that are further afield as a means to raise revenues to then reinvest in renewable energy, I could see that. But whether or not you get the right outcomes in New England or not, I think would have to be studied because we've already seen that. I think often we lose sight of this fact that we're all working um, within the context of one interconnected power system. And, and so, you know, if one state does something, it's going to affect the other state, uh, whether you like it or not, just because of the way the power system works. So as an example, um, Massachusetts put, put in place some fairly stringent emissions constraints, which will reduce the emissions from generators within the state of Massachusetts. But the consequence is you might run a gas fired generator harder in Connecticut or in New Hampshire, right? So I'm, I'm sure that, that Massachusetts policymakers weren't necessarily think about, thinking about that outcome, but the, the way the system works is that we're bound together actually as a region, whether we like it or not. And so I do see that as a region, we all have a common goal here. And it's how do we try and create some uh, alignment, uh, I think, in the policies to have us do this as cost effectively as possible. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm just looking at, at the amount of uh, uh, waste that we have in the system uh, and, and looking at initiatives to try to see how we can bring down uh, some of the, the volume of energy that we will uh, need to have new energy as we, as you mentioned with the Brattle study and looking at energy either doubling or possibly tripling depending upon uh, uh, what we uh, what we do in the future. And a big piece of meeting that is not utilizing it in the first place. Uh, and, and so thank you very much. Senator Famica has been patiently waiting in Connecticut. So we'll have you uh, go next. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Senator. And thanks, uh, Gordon, for that uh, comprehensive presentation. We appreciate that too. You know, to the point um, of, of TCI, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. There has to be a more collaborative effort. Uh, and if we're going to try to do um, improvement in the climate over our states individually with a west to east wind flow, uh, we better start involving people to the west. I think that, uh, uh, you know, we're going to participate in something like that. Um, also, to the point I think was made by both of you that, that we have billions of dollars coming in from the feds and people are coming out of the pandemic and to add another another cost on top of that, I think, is why we've seen a lot of the resistance, uh, you know, that we're looking at. Um, 
So I think that's definite the, a role that the, this committee and, and the uh, CSG can play uh, to help collaborate and, and uh, coordinate conversations among states so that we can work better together. And one, one of the questions that, that has been asked kind of relates to that. That is a, um, the billions of dollars coming in, you know, does that transmission upgrade uh, going to go to reduce the cost to utilities and then ultimately the ratepayers? Um, you know, and, and I believe we have to go through that money uh, first and, and get a conversation on how best to use that money, especially as it relates to interest, interest state issues. Um, and then the other question has to do with getting a gas pipeline through New York and in New England. You know, we tried that, I think, my first year or so in, in the Senate 2015. Uh, and that, we all know that what happened there, that was kind of rebuffed. So, you know, I, I wrapped those two questions uh, along with my comment to you, uh, Gordon, you know, for your response. So I, I personally do not think we're going to see additional pipeline investment in this region. I just don't see it happening anymore because ultimately to make it happen, you need, you need somebody to commit to pay for the pipeline. That's what you need. And the generators aren't going to do it. And I don't think the states are going to do it. And so I, I look at that as that was you know, a possibility some years ago, but it, it's not a possibility looking forward. And, and I understand, you know, if, if you look at this from the perspective of limiting the amount of gas that we use in the region, why people are thinking that way today. So then the question becomes, well, if you can't get new pipelines built into the region and you've got the dependency on natural gas, and you've got this gas pipeline constraint problem in the winter time that leaves you dependent on these balancing fuels that we have today, the liquefied natural gas and, and the oil. So what's the plan in terms of firming that up? And, you know, I look at the oil and say, that's not a long-term solution. It's very carbon. The emissions profile from burning heavy oil in particular is the same as burning coal. So, it doesn't make sense to rely on 50, 60 year old units in the long run to satisfy that. The LNG, I think, um, makes more sense in some ways because, um, you know, we have a fleet of highly efficient combined cycles that can convert that gas into electricity. And we're going to need those combined cycles for many decades to come. The issue really though, is do we want to supply, do we want to rely on LNG coming from another part of the world? That to me doesn't make any sense in the long run either. And so the question is, could you, could you avoid that dependency on LNG by bringing in other energy sources perhaps? But I think the volume of energy to supplant that dependency is such that it would be difficult. And, and so I think the question really in the, sh in the short to medium term is what's the region going to do to um, using what we have today to sort of bolster the energy cushion available to the region. And uh, we know that Hydro-Quebec offers a partial answer because they can supply us additional hydro energy that can allow us to wean ourselves of some of this dependency. But that means we've got to be able to build the transmission lines north to south which as we are discovering again, is very hard to do. So um, I, th I think the other thing, I, the other message I've been trying to deliver is don't expect the ISO to solve this problem. So the ISO wholesale electricity markets are gonna optimize the use of what's available on the system at any moment in time. And they will drive the generators to optimize the use of the fuels that are available in the system. But to think that we're going to be able to drive a subset of the generators in the region to firm up a fuel supply chain that is used by multiple in industries, I don't think that's going to happen. So, you know, years ago, I thought there was a possibility that we could come up with some um, clever market design that would, that would drive that outcome. But the best we could come up with was out of market programs, basically programs that would put oil in tanks and maybe sign up for a bit of LNG 
And FERC told us to stop that because it is discriminatory. It's out of market. It's creating all kinds of pricing problems in the marketplace. So the question really is, how does this region firm up that input energy source in, a, in, in an appropriate manner? I think the ISO can be part of the solution as we move forward new ancillary services in the market, we can pay generators to firm up uh, a set of reserves that will allow us to deal with contingencies on the system, but it would be extraordinarily expensive for us to try and produce a two week energy reserve, such as I described the, the Norwegians do um, through a wholesale market structure. So I think that to me is an open question. Uh, I think that uh, it's an open question because we've not yet had to answer that question. I'm putting it on the table as something to talk about and think about. As I've said to the state regulators, what recent weather events have demonstrated to me is that there's a lot of risk out there. It, it happens to be low probability, high impact events like the Texas event or the, the wildfires in California that caused the rolling blackout. So the question really, the policy question is, how much of that risk do we want to hedge through the wholesale electricity markets? And how much of that risk do we want to hedge outside of the markets? And I think in many ways, the states have more tools at your disposal to hedge that risk than the ISO does, because we can only hedge that risk through a certain um, ecosystem that's highly regulated and requires us to be non-discriminatory to clear these services through a uh, uniform clearing price auction and so forth. And so I think I can see us hedging a, a slice of this risk through our market, but the bulk of the risk for these low probability events is gonna, is gonna remain unmitigated. And so if we, so then the question is, what do we wanna do with that? We try, wanna try and mitigate that risk or do we want to just accept that risk and know that when we're in that circumstance, we've got to be good at operating through that circumstance, which means ultimately the ISO will balance supply and demand at the wholesale level through controlled outages. And then the distribution companies need to be able to rotate those outages and not get stuck in the situation that we saw in Texas where you had you know, the city of Houston with its lights on and neighborhoods with their lights all for five days in a row. That's not a, an acceptable societal outcome. But I don't think we're yet in the place in this region where we can know with confidence that we could rotate those outages that seamlessly. But that's the, I think that's the big policy question. And I, and I think what I'm trying to be is honest about what we can cover and what we can't cover because I'm hoping that will advance the conversation. If we hold out that somehow we're going to cover all this risk through the wholesale market, then what we're unfortunately perpetuating would be uh, an incorrect assumption that will come back to haunt us later. Well, so, yeah. Yeah. Senator Famica. So, if you Pete, I think was going to jump in and say okay, something. Okay, Pete, yes. I just wanted to. Uh, listening to this conversation about the energy ways to wholesale markets and uh, I believe that to take decarbonizing serious we got to look at both sides of the equation and we've talked a lot about the supply side and there's this whole uh, senator you talked about all the waste in energy out there uh, the ISO I think we're probably the only ISO that allows energy efficiency uh, to be paid through our capacity markets. The other thing that we did was we put a lot of effort uh, a number of years ago for demand response to uh, be part of our market. And I could dispatch demand off. We have the tools today. What we don't have is we don't have uh, the load coming to the market to allow me to dispatch uh, their power off. So rather than bringing a generator on, I could tell load to come off the system. It's within our system. We model it. We have the capability to send a dispatch signal out there. So when you talk about, you know, what can be done, how do we, uh, uh, you know, go after that waste, there may be times where we shut off that energy rather than 
having to bring on or ramp up a fossil unit when we don't have renewable energies. So we got to think along those lines. So we got to think about the other side of the equation. And we have put in place uh, things in our wholesale market to allow those things to happen. Pete, so you made an excellent point here. Um, and thank you for raising it. Because this is somewhere I think that state policymakers can really help. So the point you made about getting demand side of the market, the demand side of the market more engaged is, is an excellent point. And, and the part of the problem today is retail customers do not see through pricing what's happening on the power system. They basically see a flat rate. So if you look at your, the daily rate that you're getting through your hedge standard offer, it doesn't vary. And you know, think about I look I think about that in the context of what Pete just said, which is when things are really stressed on the grid, we need to have people taking themselves off the system because it's expensive. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's going to be a bigger problem, I think, with batteries on the system, as well as with uh, electric vehicles. So I, you know, we were just we went through this uh, exercise a few weeks ago called GridX, where we model extreme weather conditions and we basically do a, a very sophisticated simulation with all of the transmission owners, uh, distribution companies in the region. And one of the things we, re we realized was that there's a lot of distributed storage that's on the system today uh, and it's growing and there's no off switch on it, right? So if we think about this in the context of, we wanted to be there to take care of us locally when there's a problem with the grid. But what happens if you're in a situation where you're trying to get demand off the system, the battery's depleted and it's trying to charge. So whether the battery is your home battery or your, your Tesla Powerwall, or the battery happens to be your vehicle that's looking to charge at exactly the same time as the grid's in trouble, how do you get it to get off the system because you're actually making the problem worse at that moment in time. And so the only way I think we can solve that is through operational coordination with the distribution companies and pricing it. So having retail consumers know that there's a problem and that it's exactly the wrong time to be charging your battery. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Gordon. That is, that is so important. And that's, uh, you know, that speaks to smart grid technology as well because without the communication uh, to the customer in terms of what is taking place, we see a lot of uh, communication systems in, in Europe and in parts of the US where they've done a lot more investment in smart grid technology, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to be seeing that. Um, Senator Famica, uh, any additional question? We, I think we have uh, Representative, uh, I always have a tough time pronouncing his name, so I'm going to spell it, uh, Y-A-N-T-A-C-H-K-A. -A -A. Uh, uh, Representative, I know you had a question that Senator Famica utilized relative to the, uh, uh, to, uh, infrastructure bill and reduction of cost to utilities in the states but i'm not sure if that if it's that one you wanted to follow up on or, or did you have another question i actually have another question that has to do with uh how we approach the uh question of energy storage um <clears throat> is this is this something that we should be developing policy as, at the state level on or is it something that should be more coordinated through iso new england and uh, you mentioned battery, batteries as a uh, means of storage, but I'm thinking more along the lines of uh, hydrogen generation and then utilization of, of uh, compressed hydrogen as a uh, storage vehicle, especially with uh, offshore wind coming online, you got a lot of water there. Yeah, so, and actually also, I forgot to answer one uh, question from, uh, Senator Formica, so I'll, I'll answer yours and his actually. So with regard to storage, I think short-term storage, partic particularly lithium ion batteries have enough incentives in the marketplace right now for them to be economic. 
um, and some of the study results that we're sharing with our participants on the pathways, the clean energy pathways, show that as we progress and add more and more renewable energy onto the system and drive prices down for the most part, um, it's going to create some opportunities for storage. So the real problem is long duration storage. So taking energy and storing it and setting it aside for an event like we see in a polar vortex, where you can release that energy back onto the system and have it be available for an extended period. So, and, and so I think that type of storage, the long duration storage, whether it's in the form of long duration batteries, 100 hour batteries, for example, or um, a clean fuel like clean hydrogen or some form of clean fuel, those are not economic yet. And so they might need a helping hand. So I, you know, I look at green hydrogen, the economics around it are daunting. Uh, it's really expensive. Once we get enough renewables in the system, there'll be times when we have enough surplus re renewable energy that you can actually pay for the electrolysis. You'll be actually paid to produce green hydrogen. So I think uh, uh, that will come eventually, but the problem is how do you get that industry started? In, in New England. So I think that's the that's a big question. And just like the states have acted together to get the solar industry started and the wind industry started in New England, you may want to think about how do you get long duration storage um, uh, underway. But I caution you to distinguish between that and short duration storage, which I think there's ample incentives in place. And the other thing I would say is the short duration storage is good for managing day-to-day -day events, but it's not really helpful for these long duration events. Through this modeling exercise we just went through, we actually found that they could end up becoming an efficiency loss on the system. If what you're doing in a, in a period of time when you don't have enough energy for a week and you're cycling a battery and you're burning a fuel to charge a battery, you're actually losing energy in that process. So I think we've got to be careful about how much money you put behind short duration batteries because <clears throat> I think they will have less value over time with regard to the, the big problems that we're trying to solve. And then to, to Senator Formica's uh, question about the allocation of transmission of some of this federal money that's coming, I know, when, in the very, very uh, varying bills that I've seen, the amounts of money being set aside for transmission investments are actually fairly modest in the scheme of things. It's not clear to me how New England's going to get its fair share of that. And so I do think we, we have said that it'd be great if the states could act together to see whether we can get a piece of that for New England, but it'll only be a fraction of the, of the transmission investment that's required. And so I think the states really do need to be in the lead on deciding whether to, how to deploy that funding. Because you could decide, for example, to say we want to have it be a down payment on some of the integration of the offshore wind. Or you could say we want it to be a down payment on access to hydro energy from Quebec, for example. But it's, um, you know, it's not clear to me who makes that decision. It's certainly not the ISO. And so I think there's a conversation coming here in this region on, on how do you steer that funding in a manner that is efficiently deployed here in New England. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Gordon. Um, Representative, uh, did that answer your question? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, it gave me a perspective on it and uh, um, I, I guess we'll uh, see how that hydrogen economy develops in the future, I guess. Thank you very much. And Senator Famica. Uh, you know, I, it, it did. I think it speaks to the need for, for broader conversations. And I think that's probably the, um, where ISO can be, you know, can be effective and, and uh, being at a seat at the table with, you know, all of your participants so that we can, uh, you know, really take this type of presentation and, you know, not just look at what's going to be short term or uh, shortages, perhaps with a, with a cold winter, 
you know, how can we invest those dollars that are coming in from the state uh, to the states from the feds um, in, a, in a way that kind of is more collaborative? And I know that uh, Senator Needleman is on on the on the call today, and I don't want to speak for him, but we, uh, as he's chair of the Connecticut Energy uh, and Technology Committee, and we've spoken already about the potential of having forums, you know, to address this issue uh, in the coming session and talk about how, you know, how ISO connects with uh, policy in Connecticut and then in a broader a regional state. So, um, so I, I think that that's, that's an important part of the conversation. But, so, Senator, you've just triggered a thought to sort of join two dots together. So if, to the extent there's a appetite for U.S. legislators to talk through this, it, it might be useful to connect your, this conversation with the conversation that NESCO, the New England State Committee on Electricity, has already asked us to um, do work on the 2050 transmission plan. So one of our deliverables during the course of 2022 will be to sketch out different transmission scenarios, trans transmission investment scenarios. And the point of that whole exercise was the states, the state regulators and the state policy folk in the executive branch wanted to understand which were the most cost-effective transmission investments for the region. So <clears throat> ultimately we see that um, it's going to be important for the states to give us direction on where that transmission investment should go. Uh, in our recent comments that we filed at the FERC, we said we want the states to be in the lead on making the decisions on public policy investments in transmission. And, uh, and so this question will come back to the states. And uh, if you're considering this within your forums, it might be great to get NESCO into the same room and, uh, and have them also be at the table for this conversation. Well, it might be a good idea uh, with that suggestion, Gordon, and to follow up on what Senator Femeca had, uh, <clears throat> had uh, said, that also CSG right here uh, could be a, uh, a conduit for some of that discussion. Uh, I really think that the time is coming upon us very quickly with the federal resources that are coming down before all of our states uh, go ahead and spend the money uh, with, uh, as Tip O'Neill once said, all, all politics is local. So uh, what happens, uh, the tendency is to invest those funds in, in local initiatives that uh, are eligible uh, for funding in uh, we're not always looking at what the regional impacts of something as uh, you know like uh, what we need to be doing within the ISO region relative to transmission. Uh, those of us that have been involved with offshore wind or hydro uh, from Quebec certainly appreciate it, but uh, beyond that, uh, a lot of us in the legislature and actually some of the executive branch you know, leadership uh, is not necessarily focusing on that as a top priority. And it's something that we really should be focusing on uh, together as a, as a region. And this might be a, an opportunity for, uh, uh, to, keep, to keep Rona busy again. <laughs> you know, but we'll, uh, Rona and I will talk and we'll talk with Senator Famica, but there may be an opportunity here for bringing together uh, a number of us to really have a regional summit about uh, this question, uh, you know, in terms of transmission. I know that uh, the recent decision uh, that took place is finding its way through the courts and we'll have some determination there about that piece of the transmission line but it's also about uh, Hydro-Quebec and other opportunities to get uh, battery storage through Hydro up uh, and uh, much more dependent uh, uh, to uh, uh, on other alternatives that we can, we can have, uh, you know, to deal with 
uh, to deal with what we uh, need to need to deal with, including coming down the, the, the shoreline if we need to from the uh, down the east east coast. Um, I just wanted to recognize uh, there's a Jonathan Steinberg who had a question and if we can open him up and then after him, uh, Norman uh, Needleman. Jonathan, are you unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Jonathan. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, my question was related to the comments by Gordon with regard to needing to educate and sensitize consumers to the impending challenges we're going to be facing with uh, energy uh, shortages, uh, even on a spot basis. And I suggested that we, as a region, are lagging in requiring adoption of smart technologies, specifically smart meters and the accompanying software to finally bring the consumer into a position to make choices uh, with regard to time of use. And that kind of education, I believe, will eventually lead to not only further conservation, but perhaps further demands for improvements to the system to meet the future needs. But we are not asking much of the uh, EDCs at this point in terms of implementation, at least in Connecticut. And uh, unless we, until we get to a real demand response mechanism, I don't see changing consumer behaviors. I think that's an excellent point. I agree with you. <clears throat> so I think that's one, that is a policy question. And I mean, I understand the, how hard it is because on the one hand, we want to be protective of consumers and, and make sure that they don't get caught by surprise. But on the other hand, we also want them to respond when it's needed. And I think smart metering and dynamic pricing offers that opportunity. And it's, um, I think in the long run, if we don't do it, we're gonna find ourselves with a real problem with electrification of vehicles because the distribution system is not set up to simultaneously charge all these vehicles. So I think as a matter of cost effectiveness at the distribution system, there's gonna to have to be some way of getting people to be careful about when they charge their vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to certainly have to have a coordinated system. Uh, Norm Needleman. How are you, Senator? Thank you. Uh, how are you? Could you introduce um, yourself to us and then give us your question? Not sure I can even introduce myself to me right now. Okay. Um, you have to excuse me for not having much of a voice. Um, Senator Famika could tell you I'm usually pretty short-winded, um, get right to the point. And, uh, get comfortable, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> get your pillows out. No, um, I uh, appreciate everything I've heard, a lot of uh, interesting stuff. Um, I've been uh, chair of uh, the Energy Committee for three years in the Senate yes. um, with, uh, with Representative Arcante and Senator Formica, been an excellent uh, ranking member. Rem ranking member. Uh, we've worked very closely together and we're all pretty like-minded on uh, most of these issues. Um, except for the fact that Paul is an overwhelming supporter of TCI. You got that recorded? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, we are I, recording, actually. So no, I know. I'm over ahead. It was a joke. It was purely a joke. Yep. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so everything I'm hearing, Gordon, um, uh, you know, we've had these conversations before. I've had them with ISO. Um, I never walk away from these conversations uh, feeling more secure in the fact that when I flip my uh, switch to turn on my electricity, it's going to be there. Um, and as I said in my last conversation with Eversource, um, it appears to me that we have a, um, a market design problem here. The, whether Whatever 
all these different organizations have their hand in this thing. And um, I'm not sure that the system as it's designed provides the resiliency, the reliability, the equity to the states um, that uh, we're gonna all need as we look to move forward as, um, as Paul said, to a more renewable future, but looking at cost and all the other factors that we have to look at. Um, and obviously not pointing fingers, but ISO is always right in the middle of this because you do everything, but you basically say you don't do much. You don't have control over policy, um, which again, you may not. And I actually believe you um, when you say that, but I also wonder if that's the way it should be. We, we live in this world with a system that die was cast in 99 or 2000 when deregulation occurred. Uh, you know, I was um, in high school when that happened. So I don't really know exactly what led to it and how it happened. I know as a business owner, um, owning four manufacturing plants, three in Connecticut, one in Michigan. Um, I know that reliability and price have been a major issue for me. And as I look to expand, I'm not sure that, you know, it makes sense from an, uh, being an energy intensive business, this makes the most sense. Um, so again, how do, do, do we really need to think this thing through from the beginning again? Um, you know, we have um, a commissioner of DEEP who may or may not be listening on this call, but she's been very, very clear that the design of ISO doesn't serve the interests of Connecticut. Um, you know that, I'm sure you've heard it loud and clear. Um, I, I don't necessarily have enough information to agree or not agree, but on multiple occasions, I've seen different bits of information that talk about circumstances in which we might have rolling blackouts. I, I don't know if that freaks everybody else out that's on this call, but it certainly scares the bejesus out of me um, because that's not what you want. Apart from um, being the state senator here, I'm a first selectman. I own a business. I, I worry about having to deal with my residents um, when on a day when it's 10 degrees below zero, they lose power. Um, I, that, that's just not an acceptable alternative. Uh, if we've learned anything, we know that those isolated random situations that occur are more likely to occur. And again, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but does this market design really lend itself to that kind of energy security that we really need? Um, so it's, it's less of a question and more of a statement that I think we're running around in circles here. Uh, most people are looking to get to the same point, uh, but we keep having this issue crop up and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the issues around the desire to electrify everything. That, that's only gonna make this problem worse. So we have electric distribution companies that actually own a share of the pipeline. You know, Eversource has a committed interest in that pipeline. The build out of um, the gas infrastructure never really met expected demand. So they rightly pawn it off on the generators on a as needed basis. But there will come that point at which they say, we need it for our customers for heat and whatever other uses there are. We just don't have it. The generators don't really lose anything because they lose a day or two days worth of production. They don't have any skin in the game here. So however we've designed this, everybody sells into this market. Nobody on the generation side wants to commit. And yet we're sitting here worried about outages. So I have some thoughts to share with you on this topic if you're interested. Maybe offline, that, that would be fine. Um, I, I'd, I'd actually like to do that, but I, I think I want solutions here. 
as uh, one of the policymakers in Connecticut, I feel like I have an obligation to the residents of Connecticut to come up with solutions. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly where that takes us, but I know that the situation is no good. I do have one question for you though, Gordon. Okay. You guys are experts um, in the market, um, not all aspects, obviously, but if you had to take a guess, 2040, grid level, what percentage of our energy is going to be generated um, from natural gas still? Hmm. Well, take a guess. I think the, the problem with guessing that number is whether or not you meet the decarbonization goals or not. So, you know, I think the answer is it's going to have to be a much lower percentage than it is today if we're going to meet the decarbonization goals. But that depends on us building out all this infrastructure that we've been talking about, the transmission, the offshore wind, and so forth. And so you can get into this debate about whether we're moving swiftly on enough to actually achieve that decarbonization goal. But, <clears throat> um, you know, just off the top of my head, I, I think the there's still going to be a substantial amount of gas utilized on the system. The way I think about it, though, is gas is going to move more and more into a peaking fuel rather than a fuel that supplies energy on average during the course of the year. And so that peak, though, is the problem. The peak's going to grow. So if you, you know, if you conceptualize a world where you really push the system all the way to most of the energy is coming from renewables, um, but then you have a nor'easter that comes in a blows too hard for four days and the wind turbines offshore can't produce energy um, and you've got cloud cover and you don't have enough sunshine, then there has to be something that's going to fill in that gap. And it'll be in a huge amount of energy for, you know, days and weeks on end. In the scheme of 8,760 hours of the year, though, it'll still be a small percentage, if you see what I mean. And right. so the problem so the problem is, how do you set the system up to give you that burst of energy for that five-day, two-week period, and then go away again? <clears throat> because the renewables, together with short-duration st storage, are doing most of the work most of the time for the rest of the year. That's sort right. of the engineering problem that we have to solve. And you know, I'll take a moment just to give you one thought. Um, you know, that traffic light slide that I set up. Um, if you think about our markets really as solving and optimizing for the investment in the machinery in the system that's converting input energy sources into electricity, I think it'll do a good job of that. And we can set up the reserve ancillary services to cover contingencies on the machinery. But we've already recognized the transmission is, is a cost of service um, arrangement. And so we're socializing the cost of the transmission. The part we haven't recognized yet is that we're relying on a market to drive investment in a supporting uh, supply chain. And so you're a business owner, just listening to what you've said. And so the question is, well, you know, how are you making sure that the supply chain brings you the commodity that you need when you need it? That's the correct. Problem. And so, I don't I think I think so that. Let me let me stop. Yeah. Let me just stop you right there, Gordon. That's the, that's one of the fundamental questions. Mm -hmm. um, does this type of market design work to optimize that? Is it there is, a better is. way? Have you guys thought about a better way? Yeah, we've thought a lot about this over the last. I would hope so. Three decades, and right. I, I and I think that the the conclusion I've come to is that this market will help optimize the utilization of the fuels that are available within the region and it will do some to actually buy some of the supply chain that you need but it's not going to buy what you need to deal with the really extreme low probability event so no one in this market is going to cover the texas event no the texas event is but, in some I, measure unique to the insanity of Texas with but, all well, the no, of Texas. Well, let, me, let me put it to you differently. That whether that uh, polar vortex event that I described, set aside what happened in Texas for a moment. But if we have a weather pattern that settles in over this region 
for a week or two, with minus 25 below the average, average expected temperatures. <clears throat> the problem is, if you're expecting the market to hedge that, they need to have confidence that that is going to happen frequently enough to make it worth their while to hedge that event. And so that's the problem, you know. So if you look in any of these market meltdowns, whether it was the economic meltdown in the financial markets in 2008 and 2009, or the Texas event, or the California event, you can always find some smart participant who did hedge themselves and they were fine. The problem is how do you get the collective behavior to hedge this very low probability risk, which is very difficult for them to justify investing in. And so that's when you get to public policy. And I, and I think that's all a reliability standard, you know? So I think there's ways to do this, but it's not gonna be through price signals per se, it's gonna be through the creation of some requirement, either outside of the market or a requirement that you put onto the market to say, you have to go and do that and buy for that and we'll pay you for it. But that's the, I think that's the missing piece to this. And, I, and the problem with, you know, the arrangements that we have at the moment um, under the FERC as we're obliged to actually set these reliability services up in a way that are non-discriminatory and technology neutral. And I think you're gonna, there are limits to how much of this risk you're gonna hedge through such a construct. So you could say, well, to heck with it, let's throw away the construct and go back to the drawing board and, and design something completely new. But I think the problems of coordinating the investments in, in infrastructure are going to be the same. You just will have moved it to a different place. And so then the question is, well, who's going to do that, right? So I, I think we've got a system in place. It's working reasonably well, except for these events that we all worry about. I am also worried about it, as you are. I, I know you are. And, and so, so I, that's why I'm saying we need a solution to it. We, we do. And um, <clears throat> again, I led by saying the market design troubles me, um, has troubled me since I've gotten involved in this. And, um, and I wonder if we need to go back to the drawing board. The problem really is, and you know, um, in, in the General Assembly this past year, we spent a lot of time debating zoning issues and towns setting their own zoning regulations. Some people felt that that was excluding people from the housing market. So there was a desire for the state to take some you know, responsibility in local zoning. What we've effectively done is we've ceded any local control, meaning Connecticut control, to an agency uh, with all due respect that we don't have a lot of sale, right? Because you are accountable to FERC. Um, I'm not sure that in the design of our ISO, we don't have a fundamental problem because we can't sit down and sort of manage that if that's manageable. And it may be that the interests of the, the states diverge from the interests of the region in some area because we have different policy goals. And you know that um, Commissioner Dykes has been very vocal about the fact that our policy goals be it millstone or wind or solar or whatever other plans we have, we, we, for the privilege of trying to be leaders in certain areas, we get the, um, uh, we get the benefit of paying twice. <laughs> so I'm not sure that I look at that as a great option. Um, you know, the, the siting of plants. And uh, I, I had been verbally agnostic about killingly the, the, the decisions around Killingly um, had less to do with Connecticut and its desires than had to do with ISO, placing plants in different areas based on how the market is designed. So I'm, I'm concerned that it, at times, not always, but at times our goals in Connecticut run contrary to the goals and the design of the market based on how ISO performs. Just a statement, I'm not sure I'm smart enough to have a plan on how to deal with it. You guys have paid the big bucks for it. So I'm gonna, Paul I, I can go on a roll. I'm pretty much done, uh, but thank you. I think, thank you, Mr. Continue. Chairman. I think, thank uh, you very much, Senator yeah. Famica. 
I, I was just going to thank uh, Chairman Needleman for, you know, his insights and in spurring the conversation. And it sounds like that's another opportunity for a forum uh, for CSG that we can talk about, or uh, certainly a standing invitation to Gordon and his team down to Connecticut for our forum. So, um, sorry, I lost you there. Um, and and so, but but I I think uh, I think it's a point well made, and we need to have further further conversation. So. Um, I know we've, we're kind of almost an hour beyond where we were going to go, um, and uh, I see Rona getting nervous there. So I don't know if we're <laughs> all right or we're not all right. But uh, yeah, Senator, where, where do you think we go from here, Senator? I think we wrap it up by five. That's for sure. So, uh, but but it's it's great to see the interest, uh, and that's uh, that's that's good. Uh, we've, we're at, uh, we, we have about like nine minutes, uh, left before five, which is an hour beyond when we were supposed to conclude, uh, the discussion. So Gordon, you, you've got us all, uh, you've got us all talking. Uh, let me just open it up to, uh, there was one other question about a, uh, uh, I think Jonathan Steinberg said, uh, in the chat. We need a regional strategic electron reserve. Uh, I don't know that 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 uh, that's that's interesting, but I think what is really happening here, just as a uh, reaction to what Chairman Needleman was saying and what you said in response, uh, Gordon, at least from my perspective. We're seeing a you know a changing set of policies uh, throughout the North East and throughout the country in terms of each state's reaction as to what we need to be what we need to be doing and putting policies in place. And I can remember having some discussions with uh, with uh, ISO a number of years ago when we were being told that we couldn't do what we're doing today. Uh, and, and they wouldn't be able to manage the grid in a way uh, that would uh, have uh, such changes to uh, the grid relative to the type of uh, energy supply uh, that was uh, part of the grid. And one of the graphs you showed us earlier going back to, um, you know, 2020 uh, and, and going back to, you know, over a 10 year period and how things have changed uh, with oil and coal. Uh, a lot of those changes are a direct result of, you know, state policies that were put in place that have changed things significantly. So uh, I think ISO, uh, to a certain extent, a lot of the utilities, I would say, have really moved pretty slowly in trying to meet what some of the states have, uh, have asked for. I'm starting to see that change a little bit now, and I'm pleased to see some of what ISO has been saying in, in your clarification, uh, Gordon, throwing it back to all of us. Well, if you want the policies to change, you got to change the policies. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, let me, let me just uh, open it up for any final comments that you may have, Gordon, or um, anyone on your team, or any legislator that's on right now that hasn't uh, uh, got a response or has any suggestion, this is the time to do it within the six minutes we have left. <laughs> uh, Rona, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I just had a quick question. Um, and, and Gordon, I, I want to thank you for this incredible presentation. I know we've gone way over and you've been so patient with us and, and, and thank you. And Thank you, Eric, and, and thank you to your staff. It's, it's been really terrific to work with you. And we'd certainly be happy, as has been suggested several times here, to, to host uh, <coughs> events because there's so much here to, to talk about. But I just have a quick nagging question for you, and I'm, I'm sorry to prolong things further, but 
you know, I'm just wondering, you know, we're talking about the challenges of vehicle electrification and I'm wondering if there's been any discussion of analyzing the use of EVs as a resource. Um, they still make up a small percentage of the vehicle fleet, but before long, we're going to have millions of, of EVs on, on the roads. And so using EVs as a resource, perhaps creating a, um, through aggregation, creating some sort of virtual power plan and using vehicle to grid technology to provide grid services, ancillary services, mm -hmm. and also to provide benefits to vehicle owners. I know there are technological challenges, but I'm wondering if there's just been any, any discussion with the distribution companies of looking at that possibility. Well, we recognize that this is a possibility, you know, it's, uh, technically feasible to aggregate, I would say probably more likely the, the charges than the batteries themselves, but you could also look at it and say there's a way to sort of discharge the batteries and put that energy back onto the grid. There's no impediment within our market design to, uh, that prevents that. Uh, as Pete Brandine pointed out, we have DR, we allow for aggregation of demand response, we allow for <clears throat> um, distributed resources to connect and inject energy. So the way I would view um, the charges and the batteries is it's another form of either demand response, if you're turning off the charger at the right time, or it could be a dis akin to a distributed resource. So instead of the, the Tesla Powerwall being in your basement, it happens to be the battery in your car that's ejecting onto the system. So the problem though, I think, um, and the short answer to your question is we haven't studied this much at all. Um, the problem though, is that you need to have better coordination between the retail, the distribution system and the transmission system to operationalize all of this. So <clears throat> there's a FERC order that you may have heard about called order 2222. Um, where FERC has required us to make sure that we can enable this sort of distribution to transmission type of interaction. And uh, there's a compliance filing that we'll be making in February of 2022 on this. So this has been a very live conversation underway in our stakeholder process, um, but it's been done at the level of abstraction one level above what you've just described. So it's really how do you aggregate and inter allow all these different distributed resources to play with within the system. I think what will come later is the study that you're asking for, which is, okay, so how much potential is there uh, specifically from the transportation sector to be uh, one of these balancing resources? And I think there's a complicated um, question there from a policy point of view that you all are going to be involved in, which is how do you create the incentives for people to want to do that? Um, and then related to that is going to be the operational question of how do we have visibility on what's going on? So the operational problem we have today as the grid operator, we can't see what's going on in the distribution system. And um, from an energy perspective, we estimate it as best we can, but we really can't see what's going on there. And so I think it'll take us to the next evolution of um, systems to make all of this work. Mm. Very good. Thank you. Does that fully answer your question, Rona? Yes. Good. Thank you Let very us, much. Thank you very much. And Rona, let me just uh, sort of try to round this up by thanking you and the staff, Jack, everyone that has put this together. I want to thank Eric uh, from ISO for helping to prepare what uh, we would eventually uh, have here in terms of uh, uh, Gordon with us and, and, and Peter and everyone else. And I want to thank everyone uh, from various uh, parts of the uh, New England uh, for joining us uh, with our uh, Energy and Environmental Committee for this policy forum. Uh, I want to turn it back over to Gordon just for uh, a very brief closing uh, remark, and I want to turn it over to Senator Famiga for closing remarks, and then we will close it out. Gordon. Well, first of all, let me thank you all for making two hours of your time available this afternoon. I really appreciate that. We wanted to share with you what was on our mind um, to uh, sort 
Senator, to, to Senator Needleman's observation, we are as worried about this as you are, and uh, we're searching for solutions to it. And so I'm hoping this will be the start of a conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Famiga. Thank you very much uh, again. I echo all of that. And uh, the start of the conversation is really what these forums are generated to do, uh, is to continue the conversation about collaboration and, and all of that. I just want to uh, thank everybody for being on and uh, thank Rona for all the work you did and Eric, all the work you did to, to kind of make all this possible. And I look forward to uh, Gordon, you joining us in Connecticut and perhaps uh, you know meeting with CSG again uh, in a broader sense to try to to try to move this issue forward. Thank you all. Thank you, Senator. And I want to just uh, conclude by thanking everybody one more time and to say that there is a lot happening out there right now. I just look in my district and I had a meeting the other day where I have uh, 160 megawatts of battery storage being developed uh, that I didn't even know was taking place uh it's it's happening in two or three different areas just in my senatorial district uh in massachusetts so when i see that happening and see major changes in just in in terms of the distributive uh grid technology uh boy are things going to change big time over the next uh uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and so we've all got a lot to, to learn, a lot to pay attention to. And we thank everybody for their time. And in particular, the staff, as Senator Pamika said, uh, Rona and all of her team that has put this together. We thank you very much. We're going to conclude now. And please, uh, those that want to stay informed and be involved, Make sure Rona has your contact information, put it in the, in the chat if you want, but uh, she's always available uh, when she's not uh, doing one of these, uh, these events or writing uh, you know, editorials or, or doing all kinds of other policy work uh, for CSG. We thank her for her work and we thank all of you for being with us today. This concludes uh, this forum. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good Thank night. you.